is watching your students succeed in all of their different paths through life. So tonight, it's a great honor and a um, genuine pr um, pleasure for me to introduce one of my former students tonight. Margaret Griffin is here from Los Angeles, where she has a thriving design practice. So, believe it or not, um, Margaret was a first-year student during my first year of teaching at Syracuse University. I was part of a teaching team of six, and we were in charge of revamping the first-year curriculum for 120 first-year students, and Margaret was in that class. In the spring, she was in my design section with 20 students, so I came to know her quite well then. Um, I was amazed to discover that Margaret Griffin, like me, was from Pittsburgh. I, we coincidentally also had the same art teacher, a three-year pr pretty amazing course of um, classes at the Carnegie Museum um, with, a very, you know, with a man who taught for 40 years. He was quite an institution for teaching art to high school students and young people. Um, finally, like me, Margaret also ended up marrying her first-year classmate, John Enright, with whom she now practices. Um, now, after a BARC from Syracuse University, Margaret received an MARC from UVA. She found her way to um, California, where, she, uh, where her husband, John Enright, had been working for many years with Morphosis. In 1998, she established Griffin Architects, her own firm, and two years later, her husband quit his job to join, and Griffin and Wright Architects was formed. Um, there, uh, so they, you know, they they pursue unexpected solutions that transform overlooked conditions into landmark projects through their expertise in construction techniques, sustainability, and community engagement. Their work is characterized by the integration of architectural, urban, landscape, and interior design with a careful attention to detail. Perfect kind of practice for the College of Architecture and Design with all of our disciplines. Griffin Enright Architects have received more than 50 commendations for design excellence and they've been recognized extensively in national and international publications and exhibitions. Both John and Margaret bridge the profession in the academy as active educators. Margaret has taught design and technology at SciArc, the Southern California Institute of Architects. She's taught there for 14 years. Um, prior to that, she's taught for 10 years at USC, University of Southern California. Um, additionally, both John and Margaret participate in their community through public service. Margaret is on the City of Santa Monica's Architectural Review Board, and John serves on the Mayor's Advisory um, Board. Finally, both Margaret Griffin and John Enright are fellows in the AIA. So, as I said, it's such an honor for me to introduce Margaret, and I ask you to welcome her to the University of Tennessee. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. What a pleasure. Um, what a pleasure to um, have Marlene introduce me. I was so lucky to have her in my first year of design. Uh, that, that year I was uh, lucky to have two uh, female uh, professors in my first year of design. And um, that was the last time I had two female professors until uh, thesis. But uh, I was definitely part of the generation, um, maybe unlike her where I had uh, some role models um, that I could look up to, some female role models. Not that I haven't also had male role models, but I found that particularly helpful. And um, it's a delight to be here and to be introduced by you. Um, so uh, I'm just going to read a small introduction, uh, just because I want to get certain things precise. And then I'm going to go through the work um, pretty quickly. 
So uh, a true collaboration, the work shown tonight, is accomplished with my husband and partner, John Enright, over the past 20 years, as well as a large family of collaborators in the studio. The work uh, reflects our efforts to seek a new authenticity by synthesizing multiple perspectives, um, some that accentuate local conditions, while others, more essential, create new lasting um, identities. Never having fully bought into the parametric project based exclusively on topology, our work instead is a foray into uh, a new contemporary. Tonight I'll show you how we use strategies of deep inspection to harness local conditions to create new distinctions in our designs. Specifically, we're interested in hybrid strategies um, as, a, as, a, as a method to create a new authentic. So in a world where the thoroughbred or the copy of the copy of the copy has become every day, perhaps an argument could be made for the mule as an analogy for an authentic architecture. Actually, this is the problem, just realized. Um, underrated, the mule uh, is known as a workhorse. It has built empires. It improves the life of those around it. With an occasionally abrasive character, the mule solved a lot of the world's problems. Mules are man-made. Their heritage goes back to bib biblical times. At first considered mythical animals worthy of king's coronations, they're also known to have enabled the exploration of the Americas. George Washington bred mules because he knew mules could do much more than horses. They lived longer, they ate less, and they were much hardier than horses. The mule is a product of a horse and a donkey, but is itself irreproducible as a result. It cannot be copied. In a world where everything is a copy, perhaps the mule or the hybrid, which cannot be copied, is the one of a kind that we crave. So can hybrids be a new model for an authentic? In our practice, we have been, been especially interested in hybridizing um, qualities of matter, space, movement, and light, and their ability to generate new effects, new identities, and new experiences. Coming from a generation that is pre-digital, we conflate essential architectural qualities with new morphologies to create new identities that transform existing contexts that can be described, uh, described as one of a kind. Our projects are developed from synthesizing very basic, let's say essential, architectural strategies. Yet they often yield a nuanced quality that has the ability to transform the existing condition and elevates the project and the architecture. We seek to transform effect and experience through new synthetic relationships among previously disparate parts. Hybrid naturally enable this quality. They have qualities seemingly disparate, um, from seemingly disparate parts, yet they can become a new whole, whose character resists the, the reduction to a singular reading or interpretation, which adds to its character and to its authenticity. Recently, we have been reflecting on this diagram. We embrace the power of mass, stasis, and form yet we are obsessed with the more ephemeral conditions of movement, space, and lightness. This diagram is compri comprised of opposites, complementary conditions of matter, each essential to the architectural condition, yet each with differing transformative qualities, describing the inherent relationship among architectural qualities that we wrestle with while creating our projects. We seek new hybrids, sometimes through new typologies, sometimes through new effect, sometimes as a synthesis of multiple geometries. We are interested in a blurry zone, somewhere between the fox and the hedgehog. We think the mule lives there. 
Our project differ in scale and context, spanning a spectrum of environments from urban scapes, landscapes, to interior and domestic scapes. John and I are both urbanists by training, using figure ground to understand the spaces of the city, but also when designing mass and void in the domestic realm. Whether at the scale of a household, a school, a neighborhood, or a city, we seek new opportunities for cultural interaction to generate new relationships between previously discrete conditions. Uh, meaning we deploy strategic thinking to cross-examine site-specific conditions to generate new opportunities. When organizing a thought, there are many strategies to consider. Tonight, I thought I would show mostly built work, some of which is um, just recently completed and um, some of which is still under construction. But I've also included a few unbuilt projects because much like our teaching, the unbuilt work is a generator in our studio. And for us, a project is a reality, meaning it exists once we draw it. Um, the first project that I want to show you tonight is one that um, you might have seen not our uh, house, but this, this uh, upon social housing was recently on the cover, it's currently on the cover of um, Architect Magazine. And it was a competition uh, that we were invited to be a part of. Uh, 60 architects were invited to uh, produce a prototype house. Uh, and this prototype house needed to be no more than 500 square feet, and it was supposed to cost uh, $6,000. All of the houses went a little over. Um, the, of the 60 architects that um, uh, and, you know, like were invited to be a part of the project, they chose 30 of them to build. Uh, our prototype, we originally uh, thought of it um, as a, a kind of prototype that, that, could, that could be in multiples. So we had uh, three different types with uh, six different roof conditions that could be, uh, each of them could be mirrored, creating 12 different um, conditions. Uh, when we first worked on the competition, it wasn't clear to us how exactly the prototype was to be used. So in the end, uh, this is the site plan um, of the, of the, it's almost like a kind of contemporary Wiesenhof uh, made in Apan, Mexico. So um, the, let's see if I can work this. This is a new building created by Moss Architects, and then Moss Architects did the overall site plan. Our house here is, is called House 10, and uh, that's where it's located. So basically all of the 30 projects are put on this kind of um, display table, and then there's a kind of public building, uh, educational building along the top side uh, that, um, that sort of organizes all the, the kind of objects in the field. And these are some of the photos from when it was under construction. The, um, most of the architects who, who, whose projects are built here are from Mexico, but there was four American architects. So uh, our project is here. This is uh, Kalich's tower. He's from Mexico. Uh, Peter Bloom's project is here. Uh, Russell Thompson's project is here. And um, I think this is Zago's project, by Andrew Zago. Um, so uh, you can see our project in three dimensions here. And what we were really working with, uh, our idea was to make a very super efficient footprint. So our house is kind of, um, let's say, part cube, part tower. So what we did with this super efficient uh, floor plate is that we actually uh, kind of like overscaled the height. So we overscaled both heights of both floors. And then we, we took a, a kind of super uh, vernacular uh, construction type that is found all over Mexico, which is a concrete frame and slab with a block infill, and combined this with, um, with a kind of a thin shell concrete strategy. So the roof is a ruled surface, uh, much like, in, in a way, we, we are kind of combining the vernacular with uh, learning lessons from Candela. Uh, Candela's projects were more based on parabolas, uh, so ruled surfaces uh, derived from parabolas, whereas our geometry is uh, derived from uh, specific profiles. Uh, and then the, the ruled surface uh, is a kind of, um, like, let's say, quirkier kind of shape. Uh, so that's our little uh, house. And the, I, 
one of the goals that we had is that each of the little houses in our 12 different types would um, kind of gain a personality. So the, the, the elevations uh, feel like a kind, of, a, a kind of cut through the geometry, and uh, the geometry of the roof produces a particular profile on the elevations that, that begin to, to give the house a kind of character. In a way, another thing we are thinking is this is a little bit between, let's say, Los and Herak. Um, uh, so uh, part of what we were looking at as a strategy was that the ground floor would have an open living, dining, and kitchen with a super efficient stair, uh, a stair that was uh, way more efficient than you can do in America, a higher rise and a shorter tread. Uh, and then on the second floor, uh, the additional height that we would get from this roof would accomplish a few things. For one thing, it would make the second bedroom into uh, a kind of size of bedroom that would allow for four, four different beds, a kind of triple stack of uh, uh, bunk beds as well as a kind of bed on the, on the, on the uh, little loft-like space. Uh, it would also give extra uh, storage space in the master bedroom and then in the bathroom, uh, when, you, when, you, when you visit Mexico City, and parts of Mexico, everyone has their water tanks on their roof. Um, and we wanted to kind of have the water tank within the roof of our project. So these are some of our initial diagrams uh, w uh, that we submitted in the first stage of the competition. And basically, uh, you know, here's the kind of idea of the cistern, um, or the water uh, holder, be the water tank being under the roof. We could also use the, we could get collected water off of the roof, so we have some downspouts and scuppers where we can collect the water and use it for the landscape. We can also optimize our roof for solar panels. In fact, when you see the images in the um, Architect magazine, which are a little newer than my images, uh, you'll see that a lot of the projects uh, have the uh, solar panels like uh, just kind of sitting on the roof. And actually, on our roof, there is solar panels, but you don't notice them because they sit perfectly on the angle of the, the they use the slope of our roofs for the angle of the of the um, solar panels so that you, they just kind of, they don't have to be set on an angle. They're just set on the roof. So here you can just, to, you can see this kind of vernacular and, and the kind of combination with the kind of strategy of the ruled surface with Candela. And here's just some of the models of the various prototypes. One prototype here was a T-shape. All, all the houses that we, uh, all of our prototypes, what we are interested in is uh, making a cantilevered, uh, uh, using cantilever as a way to extend the space of the house and also to make it more structurally efficient. Uh, this part of Mexico uh, gets like roughly 48% of rain. So we, we wanted the front door to be covered and we wanted to have um, like uh, a covered space outside of the main living space that could extend the area of the living. So here's one of the modules and you can see that. Um, we had envisioned a kind of semi-urban typology for uh, how our house might aggregate, where each house would be set on the street, but it would also have a yard. Um, and so our house was intended to open up to this kind of yard. Here you can see this is the, the mirror of the version that was built, and here we pulled out the bathroom on the upper level floor to create the overhang for the entry. And here is how uh, at the top of the stair, each, each scheme also had a skylight that brings light both down to the stair and um, into that hallway. Um, and here you can see the super efficient uh, floor plan. So uh, the cube is, when you go out to the cantilever. So structurally, in a way, when you begin to make the cantilever, it's kind of like free space because your span is based on this, this dimension here. And so it has this kind of porch on the lower level and porch on the upper level and a super uh, uh, efficient hallway. And then these are where, uh, above here is where you kind of have those loft-like spaces for additional area. Now, I don't know. Uh, we work with a ruled surface a lot and um, Actually, we think it's a pretty simple idea, a pretty mm, strategic way to uh, have a kind of buildable curvature. But actually, uh, everyone seems to always be confused about what a ruled surface is. So even though our drawings, our construction documents were super precise and explained it quite well, like nobody understands, it's very difficult to communicate how you can make a curved surface out of straight lines. Um, so in the end, we had to send them uh, like even though we had drawings showing every single height for the formwork to go, and the, basically the formwork can be all made of straight lines. So um, we had to kind of s 
send them additional computer models, and then we also send them another project that we had showing how you can make a curved surface out of straight lines. Um, and one fascinating thing that was one of the women who was uh, running the program, she was actually the granddaughter of Candela. And when we told her the idea of the project, she was like, that's so exciting, that's my granddad. Uh, so uh, here you can see the section through the bathroom where, we, where the shape of the roof like in, it allows the water um, uh, storage to kind of not be on the outside of the roof but be contained within the shape of the roof. So these are some of the, um, these are more construction photos. I don't have the final, final photos. And you can see how it sits in the context and how it creates this, uh, you can see how it's this kind of overscaled height. And it, it's a little taller um, than some of the others, uh, although college, who are right next to you, like, went even taller. Um, but our strategy was to, like, make the really concise, the exact square footage they asked for, and then uh, kind of go taller as a way to, to, to be efficient. So, um, this next project is a project uh, that uh, a small mixed-use project I in Studio City, um, which is a part of Los Angeles uh, near Burbank, uh, near the Hollywood studios of Burbank. And our client owned this uh, parcel of land. It's right off of uh, Moore Park Street, which is a, a pretty um, important avenue in um, Studio City and, and Tuyunga Street, which is also one. And this neighborhood has a kind of, uh, right down here is a famous cafe called Aroma Cafe. And so there's a kind of a new walking quality to the street. And then uh, right in front of the building is a gas station. And so the, our client, who is, um, well, in a way, he, you could say he's one of our patrons. We, we've done a few projects for him. Um, this is his own office, is in this building, and then below, uh, his office is right here. And then this is the, the way that he walks to his assistant's office, and then this is the conference room, and these are some a few other offices, and then it has a kind of open office space here. And he really uh, wanted to uh, make a building that animates the street and animates the, this um, corner that it's on. Um, Um, anyway, so here you can see the, um, the uh, conference room, and here you can see his office, and here you can see that, um, that L-shaped window that is like uh, the kind of connection between his office and his main assistant. Um, also, you can see, so this building is partially about animating a pedestrian experience, partially about animating a car experience. Uh, of, of not just how you see it driving by, but how you see it when you're, s when you're filling up your gas tank. And so you see kind of all these park, uh, cars parked in front of it, and you see this uh, facade. He, he wanted a facade facing the gas station that would have enough complexity that when people would come to the gas station, they would see different parts of it. Um, and this is that view that you would have if you're standing at the gas station. And here's that view that you would have like looking out from his, uh, when he goes into the rest of his office, and some of how these peel-outs work. Um, uh, some of the elements are like a light box, so this box, this right here, functions as a light box at night. It, it lights up the area. Right now, the interiors haven't really been done. This is pretty rough interiors. We're about to start on the interiors with him. Um, so that remains to be seen. But what you can see from what's happening on the interiors is that these windows at different heights and in different places, they animate uh, both the open office area and the different offices and create kind of distinction within the space. So um, we, one of the bigger projects that we've done is this school uh, that was a Catholic uh, K through eight grade school. Um, and it's associated with an existing church that you see here. And then um, part of the project was that we needed to provide parking uh, for the entire, for the church on the site of the school. So uh, we had an existing building that you see here that needed to get renovated. This was a building built in 1911. It's an unreinforced masonry building that needed to get um, brought up to current cut, uh, structural codes as well as renovated. And then they wanted to kind of add a new building at the back that you see here in plan. 
uh, well, they wanted to add it. We proposed that it go in the back, but they wanted to add a new building that contained the gym, the, which is also a multi-purpose room, a new um, lunch room, a new uh, uh, library, and two new classrooms, as well as like uh, a kitchen and uh, some bathrooms. So uh, this part of the city is uh, uh, very dense. It's one of the most dense part of the cities, uh, the most densely populated part of the city that there is in Los Angeles. This congregation at this church has over 20,000 parishioners, um, a huge amount. They, they, they have like nine different masses on the weekend. Um, and so uh, this school is used 24-7. This school is used um, during the day from, say, 7 to 6 for uh, ki uh, uh, you know, children in K through 8. It's used at night during the week for, um, for uh, school for adults, for um, uh, language, you know, to learn English. And it's used on the weekend for um, church school. So literally this uh, area works 24-7. Uh, so our strategy was to put the new addition here um, at the back of the site so that uh, also the new addition um, had to upgrade the whole existing building for handicap. So we wanted to be able to have the new project connect into the existing building. This was, I forgot to mention that this building was incredibly cost effective. This building was built for uh, one third the cost of a typical uh, LAUSD school, which is a Los Angeles Unified District School. And LAUSD schools are also built for fairly cost effective. But here we literally had to make every single design move um, uh, do like five things at once. Um, so uh, just a few things about the site plan. This over here is Loyola, which is a high school, a Jesuit high school for boys. And then this uh, over here is the Greek Orth Orthodox. So really, they, my, our client only owned this property right here and then this property. And then on the other side is a city park. So it's a really impacted property. So one of the uh, first strategies that we had was to make the, fire, the required fire lane uh, go around the whole property. And um, basically, that fire lane uh, became a way to, to go to go down to the parking underneath the semi-subterranean parking garage that you see here. You could enter underneath and then go back up to create a new entrance for the school. And um, not only did this connect to parking, but this also provided a way for the, uh, the parents to queue uh, and not in the city streets. So now, all of a sudden, all the parents dropping off their kids, they had a, they had a place to be so that they're not on the city streets. And it created a new front, which is right here, to the school. Um, here you can see the, the new elevators that are part of our new project, which is over here. And here you can see this kind of existing um, uh, movement system of the existing school. So it had, a, it had a kind of large room in the front and then the classrooms here. Um, and so another big requirement was that because we put our elevator back here was we needed to have a handicap access ramp. So instead of just having a regular handicap access ramp, we, we overscaled it. We made it 10 feet wide and it became a new kind of street a new street in the project that ended in a public room that we call the Urban Porch. And so this is that new space. And this uh, Urban Porch was uh, created in a fairly simple way. Again, uh, we, one of our obsessions seems to be cantilevers. I guess that's pretty much every architect's obsession, I would say. But uh, basically, we just took these super simple, off-the-shelf Volcra trusses, and we just cantilevered them out to make this extra volume that wasn't a part of the program. And it was able to be made uh, pretty um, cost effectively, but it also is like the main nexus of the project um, that you'll see as we go through. So this is just a diagram showing how the, the, the we, like our project, gave, it kind of created a loop, a kind of spatial sequence loop. So finally, the, the, the spatial sequence on the inside of the building was kind of completed by, the, by our stair and, and our in our new street that we had created, so that it's a, it's a new kind of circulatory loop that they could use in a variety of ways. Uh, this is just showing that idea that I already talked to you about, about the getting down there. And so here you can see how it, 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 you have the new front. And um, lighting was really important on this project because it is used so much at night. And um, actually a classmate of ours uh, from Syracuse uh, helped us with the lighting. His name is, um, Peter Noble. Uh, and so this is seeing the project from the back. And basically, this, this new space that we created became the, the outdoor lunchroom. And this is how it connects 
uh, that's how it connects to the existing building. You can see the kind of bridge here. On the existing building, we dug out the basement. Uh, we, we were able to reuse the whole bottom of the basement um, in a way that it hadn't been before because we dug out all around it. And we created the, the, the playground for the kindergarten, first and second graders, and the, they have a, their separate playground. Um, this is the new multi-purpose uh, room. It was, again, uh, one of the main strategies that we could use was paint uh, for some of the spatial effects. So uh, we basically made the, the name of the school like the same height as the glass here so that when you see it from the outside, you look through and you kind of see the name of the school. This is uh, the new building that we did. Another super strategic move that we did was that we put the new building on the west side of the property so that uh, it made shade. The whole playground is in shade for um, from like 2 o'clock to 6 p.m. And this lowered the temperature on the playground by 15 degrees. Also, the whole thing behaves as a, as a, as a, as a this whole um, porch behaves as a stage and they can fit 5,000 people on top of the parking which is on the playground. And uh, in addition, you can see that most of those people are in shade. There's only a few people in the back, so it depends on what time of day, but uh, they, they tend to do most of their gatherings um, in, the, in the sort of late afternoon and early evening, and then the whole, um, all of the people in the audience are in shade. And here you can see some of the effects at night, and then Another thing is that this has become a nexus in the community. They, they use this space. Uh, it's rented out for a whole variety of, um, of functions and the, the everything from quinceañeras to health, uh, um, like, uh, what do you call it? Um, health shows, health, uh, it's not symposium, but health, health fairs where uh, the local community can learn about how they can have access to health care. Um, and the, the school uh, earns a lot of money from renting this out. Uh, but this was from a more architectural event. That's John. That's John and Tom Wiscom showing it. Um, so this is another example of like how that front occurs. So this project is a, a spec house that we did in uh, Venice Beach, uh, which we don't usually do a lot of spec house, but this client was very um, uh, unusual developer kind of client, um, and they uh, wanted a kind of more special house. So because it was a spec house, this house, uh, uh, even though there's some special qualities about it, it had to be super strategic. It had to be built for a very low amount. Um, here you can see the back, uh, again, the, the kind of cantilever, um, which was our main, I mean, splurge, essentially. Uh, and then you see this oculus, this kind of double oculus, one there and one there, which brings light down to the pool. Um, and so uh, sort of the main idea of the project is that um, you'll see in a minute how the, even though the garage is right on the front, it becomes camouflaged. Uh, and then you, we basically made this peel out that you see right here. And so the entrance is kind of into this peel out. And then here you get this like view of the pool and that's what you see right here. So when you enter into this like one and a half story space, you get a, a kind of glimpse down to the pool and at the right time, uh, of the day, uh, you see like light shining through the oculus down on the pool. So we, we make this kind of like a powerful like threshold uh, event uh, at the entrance. But really, the kind of big move on the project was we, we just slightly overscaled the garage. Uh, and then we, we, we again used um, pretty simple wood trusses and just uh, make a simple rectangle with a super efficient structure going all the way across. And then at the end, we kind of have this uh, cantilever. Um, so this site was pretty long and skinny, so basically the main idea of this uh, living room is that you, you, you feel like the space expands to the back, but also to the side. So we capitalized on the, the side of the lot, or, and the side yard, and kind of um, instead of having super tight side yards and only having a backyard, on this project, when you're in this living room, you really feel like you're in this kind of larger space of the whole site. And then, this is a view at the very top when you're up in the master bathroom. Uh, if you stand right here, you're, you're basically floating over the pool and you kind of look down onto the pool and that's what you could see there. Um, so here's the kind of front elevation and how the, the garage is camouflaged and, and even the driveway is a little bit camouflaged by the 
a grass treat that we used. Um, here you can see the peel out. And here you can see that um, kind of threshold moment where you get this uh, glimpse out to the pool. And from there, you can either go upstairs or take a few steps down into the main space. Here's that side yard condition where you see how the cantilever um, uh, kind of floats over the pool. And here's just some of the more simple elements, this kind of extra uh, kind of bonus space above in this, uh, uh, this kind of volume of the skylight that we created. But in a way, uh, super one of the tricks of this house was how to be super simple and strategic, yet, yet kind of make something with a little kick. So uh, this house, part bridge, part stage, um, it's the Griffin Enright power station because this is where we get all our power. This is our house that we just recently uh, completed. Um, uh, we live on a small hill and um, for, uh, from the bottom of our site to the top of the site, which is actually over here, this is a kind of section partway through the top of our site, is uh, thir roughly 30 feet. And our house is like nestled into the hill. It's, it's um, one part, one level is set at this level, which is right above the garage. And then there's another bedroom level up at this level. So it's a kind of split level house and that feeds out to this backyard space. And then we have a guest house at the top. Actually, if you go to the Cyark, uh YouTube channel, um, there's a new video on the house that's on the Cyark YouTube channel. It's a little long. Uh, I think it should have been a little bit shorter. So this house, so, you know, uh, I, I do landscape design uh, and landscape architecture. Um, uh, John uh, is involved in the landscape part of it, uh, more at the level of the grading um, of, 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 you know, of course we both do hardscape and grading and so forth. But I, uh, I guess one of the things maybe I got from UVA is that I became very fascinated with landscape. I didn't take any landscape courses there, but um, I had all these friends in the landscape architecture and I just became fascinated with landscape. And since so many of our projects have to do with a connection to the outside, uh, once I got to LA, I, I really uh, started, um, I basically made my own um, encyclopedia of plants that, that is all the plants that I like to work with. And um, from this, uh, now we, we do our own landscape. So uh, this is the garden design for our project. And in a way, our house is meant to kind of like almost become like camouflaged with the landscape, like almost go away. Uh, and and it, it's meant, it, it, we kind of bring the hill into our house and we bring the house into the hill. So here you just see a, um, this is our living dining kitchen area. Uh, and then our two bedrooms, we just have one daughter. Basically her whole life long, uh, sh she was told that we couldn't fix anything in the house. This was a renovation, but we really like totally transformed it. But uh, you know, she was told that we couldn't fix, for instance, the hole in the bathroom wall because we were tearing down the house soon, and uh, we didn't want to waste money, you know, fixing it up. The time. And then eventually, I don't know, she was in tenth grade, and she was like, you know, you're not really ever doing the house, are you? We said, yes, we are. So then, when she was in eleventh grade, we moved out, and we were able to. to renovate the house and she got to live in it for one year but meanwhile <laughs> and so then we made a party house because now she's gone so now we, we, we like to party uh, so the this is the guest house so this is where when Marlene comes to town she can come here and stay next time and the guest house like looks over our main house and then our this is the the, the parts of the house inside so here you can see kind of worm's eye of the project. So why I call it part bridge, part stage is like this is basically our main living space and this is um, how we look out to the garden and really it's like the garden is like a this kind of framed view and um, there's one of our little actors, Mocha, uh, not named after, you know, everyone says, well, is your next, next dog going to be LACMA? It's like, no, well, in LA that would might make more sense because Mocha is a museum in LA and LACMA is a Mocha was originally mocha colored. That's why he's called mocha. Anyway, so <laughs> what happens with the garden is that, uh, and one of the things I like about landscape is like it really changes over the seasons. So it creates these, not only does it create these ecologies, um, this right here is, a, is all time. 
uh, and so it's like a bee farm. Uh, this blooms twice a year, and it's like a bee farm. And so the, you know, like if you have an avocado tree and you live near me, your avocado tree can be pollinated. Um, and then I have a lot of uh, plants in the garden, like the aloes and um, a lot of the succulents. They attract butterflies and dragonflies and hummingbirds, and we have a lot of uh, birds that live in the backyard. And then we have a lot of uh, plants that like bloom in different times of the year. So for instance, like right now is when this plant blooms. This plant right here, which is pink moly, it only blooms once a year for like two weeks. Um, and so, you know, you can see this is what it looks like when it's not blooming. Um, but like, uh, basically in our house, uh, it, you essentially you feel like you're outside all the time. Uh, we have this stair that you see here, and this stair, um, is this kind of super lightweight stair, and you can go to the roof deck through this stair, and this is a hydraulic skylight that you can walk through. That's a kind of connection to the backyard. Here is this kind of clear story here. This is very simple. You know, our house isn't as fancy as our client's house, but it's actually pretty transformative. Um, this is the roof deck, and this is the kind of bridge connecting from the back uh, guest house. Uh, and the kind of terraces off the guest house. Here we have a fire pit. Here we have a dining table that's set into the to the terrace. And then this ramp goes down exactly 42 inches, so that when you stand on this back terrace, the guardrail on the front roof deck is the same height as the back terrace, so that that way you kind of see farther over it. Um, and this is how it kind of from above like does almost start to kind of camouflage into the hillside. This is the kind of view, kind of looking down into it. The kind of another view of the courtyard. So this is the, sorry, this is that stair I was talking about here where it's a skylight that it, you have to open it in order to walk through it. Like you, you can only have the head height that you need once it's open. So that when it's closed from the back uh, guest house, you can totally see over. And this is how from the back of the yard, you can kind of see into the house as well. So uh, this is some of the effects in terms of like living in it. Like, so this is a photo that Mark Wigley took at one of our parties. And this is another kind of effect of the house, uh, the kind of night of prom and the kind of photogenic uh, conditions. And then this is all the parents <laughs> <laughs> photographing all the kids. Uh, this is a view from our bedroom. And of course, so the whole thing opens. And this is one of my favorite views, which is the view from the shower. When you're standing in the shower, this is what you see every day. So uh, this is a project that we did in Pasadena. And uh, it's, I call it part undulating bowling, part carcass, because uh, it was a renovation of an existing house. And the new part is in here. And then the existing parts of the house are here and here. And there was an existing part here. We basically demolished what was here and, and built a kind of new connector between these two parts. And again, we did the whole landscape design. I don't have the final photos of this. We're just about to photograph it um, this fall. Uh, what happens is, since we do the landscape, we have to kind of wait till the landscape grows in before we can really shoot the houses. So a lot of times we have like, you know, we have to wait a little bit before we can shoot the house. But basically, in this project, what we were looking at was um, this uh, simple volume that we made here. And then we made this undulating ceiling. And we made a curved skylight. So actually, through these two simple means, by having this curved skylight, and again, this ruled surface for the ceiling, we actually can gain a kind of a, a double curvature, even though it's all made out of straight lines. Um, and what these curvature does for the house is it makes these different areas within the open space. It makes an area for the kitchen, and it makes a kind of lower space for the media room. It makes an area for the living room, and an area for the bar. So uh, here's some of the way that it was built, uh, again, just out of straight lines. But again, you get that feeling of the double curvature because this uh, skylight curves in plan. So you have this curving in section and curving in plan. And uh, you can see some of the qualities of light. Sometimes you get a very direct light. Sometimes you get a more indirect light. And you can also see how the ceiling and the shapes of the ceiling actually relate to some of the uh, topography beyond. Right? So there's this kind of connection of the ceiling to this uh, landscape beyond. 
At one point, this project went on hold, and the owner is a toy maker. Um, he was having some problems with the toy that he sells, and he had to re-engineer it. And I remember his fiance, when they came back, she, was, she said, well, you haven't built that, root, that ceiling for anyone else, have you? And I was like, no. I mean, it's your ceiling. She was very worried that we would use this ceiling on someone else's project, uh, which I thought was very endearing. And uh, I, I thought, you are the reason, this, you are the kind of client I like. Um, so that is a one that we still have yet to photograph. So um, this project uh, is one um, that's dear to our heart. This is by a very special client to us, of ours. It's up on the top of Point Doom. So this is a kind of figure ground of Point Doom. Our, uh, Point Doom, the actual Point Doom is here. And our client's project is like right in here. But uh, Malibu, if you've ever been to LA, um, there's a kind of like, like, a, like a cove, like, Malibu kind of sticks out. So when you look up the coast to Malibu, it's like kind of sticks out. And so when you're in Malibu, you can, you can look out to the ocean, but you can also look back and see the city of Santa Monica and see, see kind of lights. So this is our client's, um, so that's the site. And then this is the actual Point Doom, which is a big rock. And then there's another Point Doom, which splits our site in half. So there's another big rock up here that our, our project sits halfway on the big rock and halfway on the flats. Um, and so this line right here is this retaining wall, and this part of the house is up more on the rock, and then this part is like a, a shallower slope. It's still sloped, but it's a kind of shallower slope. And this project, uh, the geometry of the project is all about the views and the coastline, and setting up the views uh, from the house, uh, both out to the water, but down the coastline. Because when you live on the ocean, actually, one of the things is that at, in the daytime, looking out at the ocean is very beautiful, but at night, when you look out to the ocean, there's really nothing to see. Uh, sometimes you might see ships there if you're lucky, but so at nighttime, actually, the, the, the view is like down the coastline to, to the city lights. Um, so what happens in the project is that, um, uh, you'll see on the next slide, the, there's a kind of, um, you, enter, you enter back here, and this line here is about like the viewing the ocean. And then there's a second peelback that you'll see on the next floor, which is to the upstairs, which is the bedroom, where you kind of get the view down to Santa Monica. And then uh, this is the pool. And so it, this is this kind of like intersection between the loft-like living space and the outdoors. And this is this kind of porch. And then your, your eye is taken back out to the, to the ocean by the pool. And so what happens is you enter at a mid-level, halfway between the first floor and the second floor. And you can either go down this kind of uh, overscaled stair, or you can kind of go behind this wall and go up to the second story. And then this is just that plan. So here you have kind of kitchen, um, dining, living room, library, media room. Um, uh, this is the mo mother-in-law unit back here with a separate kind of courtyard behind. And then on the second floor, you have these uh, two bedrooms and then the kind of master suite. And so we developed these kind of peel-outs um, in order to have these rooms at the back gain an ocean view. And then this is the shower of the master, which also gets an ocean view through that peel-out. So this is the same guy that owns that office. So the peel-out windows at the office are related to this project. Um, and here you can see the... the this kind of idea about that, that peel back on the second floor and these kind of two geometries and how that sets up the view. We're also obsessed with worm's eyes. I think that has a lot to do with because we, in our projects, we really think about the ceiling a lot. Um, uh, the ceiling is, a, is another element. We, we, we don't let the ceiling be too generic, mostly. Um, but in this case, you also can kind of see this uh, sectional condition of this uh, double story space that we have going down the middle. We also did the landscape in this house. This was one of the first big landscapes that we did. Um, here you can see how the house is part, like, set into the hillside, right? So this is where you enter halfway in between, and you can go up to the second story or down to the main story, and how the, how the uh, pool is also kind of set. So the house is, again, kind of embedded in the hill. Here you can see the kind of wind, or the aerial. 
This is that master bedroom, uh, master bathroom area. We also, this is the library, and so we have this idea about a brisole. So basically, we thought about the bookshelves in the library as if they're kind of pulled out through the, through the front facade, and they became a kind of brisole that also became the guardrail on the second story, and as a kind of overscaled element on the rear facade. This is the kind of entrance where you, you see, like at the entrance, one of the things that we wanted to do is kind of um, not give away the whole view of the ocean, like to, you have a kind of peak to the ocean, you move into this uh, double story space that you see here that has these clear stories above, and you descend down a set of stairs, and then you, you have this kind of element, um, this is a kind of light box. We, we do a lot of our own lighting, and we incorporate it into our architecture a lot. So it's a kind of light becomes furniture, becomes architecture. And then basically you get this horizontal, um, you, you get this like, oh, when you finally enter the living room, you get the pow of like the horizontal of the ocean. And here's that wall beyond that you see, and then the pool beyond there, and how the pool takes your eye out to the ocean. This is some of how that, um, that double story space behaves. It's kind of like you go from this kind of tight, vertical space into this like horizontal space at the end in the living room like I was describing. This is a view from the master bedroom and how we brought the ceiling down kind of low at the entrance. And then this is a view from the bridge like into through the master bedroom and down through the living room. Uh, here's how you can see the peel outs and how the peel outs kind of uh, like contribute to let's say the massiness of the top floor. Uh, that we kind of cantilevered a little bit over the bottom floor and how we use these window boxes to kind of bring light to the, to the, to the back, uh, to the kind of entry side of the house. Uh, this is the kind of master bathroom that exists at that knuckle of the curve. And really those geometries were, were had a, like I said, had a lot to do and were derived from partially the, um, the shoreline of uh, Mal uh, Point Dune. And this is kind of on the back, seeing the pool, and, and there's this kind of wall that divides like the pool from a kind of backside, and back here is a shower and a barbecue, and so there's this kind of like, let's say more private side of the outdoor on one side of this wall, and then the more um, public side on the other side. And then here is like where you walk uh, to, to, to get access to that more private part. Um, this is a, competition that we did, you know, which obviously is not even happening. Uh, the people who won it, uh, there's a whole controversy, Helsinki doesn't really want the Guggenheim. But nonetheless, we thought, like, there's only 1,700 people participating, you know, that seemed like good odds, so why don't we try to do the competition? So, um, but we're really, uh, what we were looking at with this project is how to use the, the Guggenheim Helsinki uh, to be a new connective tissue between the harbor and the city, um, and, and to use this kind of art park to bridge the two. So this is this existing uh, park. Uh, this is our site of the project, and this is the kind of uh, an important uh, hotel that, that in the brief it said that you, you weren't meant to block it. Um, and then this is this new pedestrian way like along the edge of the harbor that they were developing. So our strategy was to make this kind of art park uh, and uh, make a variety of connections like be between the city and the water. So one of the connections is this tailpiece where you could walk like through our building and then come down a set of stairs and then go through the space. Uh, another connection is this crosswalk that we made here where you could cross over and come through. Another connection is that you could come through and walk in this inner street that we developed and then walk through. But basically, our project only touched in four places, this, 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 in the ground, and everything else floated above it. So this is a kind of delivery uh, area where the semis can back up and you can get all the deliveries into the museum. This is the main entrance of the museum, and this is the kind of amphitheater, uh, the, the auditorium, which, which whose stage worked out to an outside auditorium. And this was an extra little uh, dining piece that we had. So uh, this is how our project uh, sits on the edge of the water. And this is that inner street I was talking about. And um, this is the kind of relationship that it makes with this uh, important hotel. 
uh, and this is how it kind of floats over that public space and how we connect the kind of harbor side like back through to the to the kind of inner street and here you can see like the idea of uh, our project was really about uh, relating both to the scale of the city, but also to the kind of scale and, and idea of the boats and to the idea of the sea. So it's, it, it has a kind of animate quality uh, that, 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 it, that is intentional and that has to do with its position at the edge of the city between the water and the city. Um, and, and its scale is a lot about uh, relating to these big ships that are often in, um, at harbor. So here you can see uh, the kind of main entrance is here. You have these escalators that take you up. The, the main uh, floors of the gallery were a third, fourth, and fifth floor, and we had a whole um, special sequence of movement through there that uh, any that could be hmm, different curators could could create uh, different ways of moving through the museum. So there was a kind of flexibility. We proposed an exoskeleton so that we wouldn't need. Um, we would have as few columns as possible on the inside, so again, to give uh, flexibility for curation. And here you see the kind of amphitheater, uh, the, the auditorium, and how it, its stage uh, worked out to an outdoor amphitheater. And this is the kind of public space, like underneath uh, of the museum, and the way that it connects to the city. And this is a section through the two parts of the gallery, and this is the, the, the kind of public space. This is the inner street. Is, is the volume of the inner street is in here, and this is the kind of public space. And this is like from when you um, when you exit from the city, uh, like if you are arriving at the at the museum, this is what you would see. And so the project like frames the view to the harbor, and then this little window right here is like a glimpse up into the galleries. And this is the space that's right here in this project. So needless to say, we didn't win. Uh, but nonetheless, this project is a kind of important one for us in terms of some of the hmm, explorations that we could make at a kind of larger urban scale. So I just have two more projects. Um, this is a house that we recently completed. And um, so, you know, we, we came from an era and, and from a place where we were, uh, a, a lot of our work has, has a lot to do with movement, how, how you move through, how uh, views are set up, um, how you create thresholds. Um, but also we seem to be obsessed with this kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of, this kind of relationship between more horizontal space and more vertical space, uh, which I think that um, had a lot to do with the, the kind of way we were taught which had to do with looking at a lot of core. And so here in this project, uh, I, I, we were really after, again, this kind of vertical slot of space and then this kind of intersection with this horizontal condition of space. Uh, and you can see that here. So this is this uh, house that has this main uh, central volume that moves all the way through. And also in this house, we bring a pool like into the house. So here you can see the house. So this. Uh, uh, large volume that we make in the house. I, I say large mostly for its height, but it's actually quite compressed in, in width. Uh, that uh, is, is, is curved, and it curves from east to west. So actually this curve in plan um, tracks the sun. So the, it almost behaves like a sundial in the house. And we have this um, uh, like uh, sunshade that goes over top of it. So the sun that comes in here is like an indirect light. And this sunshade is made uh, with a refractive panels, translucent refractive panels that uh, like create a pretty amazing quality of light. So here you can see that curve shape in plan of the first floor. And then you can see how uh, the pool has this kind of reflexive um, curve going the other way. So basically, there's this uh, sycamore tree out here on the street. And uh, it's kind of on axis. So when you're in the house, you look out uh, to the sycamore tree. And you can also look out very far here. So this house is about kind of extending the view. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a bridge on the second story uh, that you can see dotted in here. And when you're on that bridge, you, you, you really feel like, like the house is um, way longer than the site. You, you just feel like this total extension of the view. 
And so here you can see this um, double volume that we have in relation to the volume of the pool. Uh, one of the tricks of the house is that um, this is the kind of basic neighborhood that it's in. And you can see in this neighborhood, which is a common thing in LA, everyone has these garages in the back and a driveway to the garage. And so one of the big moves on the house was to put the garage under the house. So now uh, we can give the whole first floor of the house to the open space. And so when you're in that first floor, you feel like you're in the space of the whole site. And then this was a, a, instead of having a garage as their accessory structure, they have a little structure back here that is the, the wife's office, uh, a small gym and a small uh, pool bath. But um, the spatial sequence of the house, which I'll just go back for a second because uh, I just want to talk about this. What happens is you, you kind of, when you come to the entry, you can see through, but you, you move off axis and you go over to this side and then you begin to walk down this curved path that's an extension of the skylight. And then as you get to this moment, it, it, it begins, and as you move to the house, that, the, the curve that's curving in the opposite, like in the same direction as the house, it begins to like open up the view. So first you're in this kind of tight space and you don't really have the view of the backyard. And as you continue moving, then you get that kind of opening up to that more horizontal view that I showed in the first picture. Uh, and then we have the, the stair uh, sits here that you'll see in a minute, and you can go uh, up the stair to a landing where there's a deck uh, where you can see the view of the Hollywood sign, and then you get turned, uh, and you go up a few more stairs when you get to the, to the second story, and then, um, which is the master is over on this side, and the, the, kid, the ch children's bedroom is over on this side, and you kind of bridge over to the children's bedroom. And then this stair that you see in plan, that's the stair from the garage. So if you enter through the garage, you enter on access with the glass bridge. And then if you're in the house, once you get in the main space, you also kind of move like around the pool. So the, the kind of forms of the house have a lot to do with how they modulate the light, but they also have a lot to do with how they mo modulate the kind of everyday movement in the house. Um, so here you can see from the back. So that sun shade that we made, uh, it, it also uh, folds down, it becomes a wall, and then and it becomes this kind of blade at the front. But that also becomes a wall that you walk through to get to this deck at that landing that I was talking about. And you can really see how in this house that uh, it opens up to this garden oasis. So one of the things that we were doing here was we wanted to kind of bring the floor, the kind of mass of the floor up and then we wanted to bring this darker ceiling that we had kind of like hang it down and have this moment where, where the kind of ceiling is kind of hanging down and doesn't touch and the floor is kind of mounded up. And so the stair becomes this kind of sculptural element in the house um, that also modulates the movement in certain precise ways. This is the glass bridge that I was talking about so you can see through it. That's looking back. Then when you, when, you, when you experience the house in the other direction, you get these kind of uh, layers. Um, uh, so the kitchen and its ceiling in one direction, and then looking from the kitchen kind of through the, the skylight uh, like over to the other um, side of the living room. So this is like when you're in the house looking up, but one of the things about this house is the quality of light is like really changing and the colors of light uh, animates the house. So if it's sunset, you have a, not one kind of color. If it's sunrise, you have another kind of color. Um, and this is this kind of moment where the pool comes into the house and where the house seems to like engulf the, the pool. And um, this is the jacuzzi at the back. So basically, if you sit in the jacuzzi, uh, this is what you see looking back into the house. And this is this sort of drawing that we did to describe that kind of, mm, like, mm, that kind of relationship between that skylight and the movement system. And this last project that I'm going to walk you through, which is very related to the one that I just showed you, uh, this is a, a set of 46 villas that uh, are under currently under construction in Chengdu, China. 
So this is a map of Chengdu, China, and the new city, that they're making a new city down here outside of the city. And so this part of the landscape was a series of small mounds um, that existed in an agrarian landscape. So they're taking these small mounds and kind of digging out around them and turning them into islands. And they're literally making a city on the water. So each one of these little islands was like a kind of natural topography that they're digging out. And our island And so uh, from the beginning, what we had as an idea for this project was to think, uh, they called them villas, but really they're pretty, they're almost like townhomes in a way. So we, we, we thought about the project as a kind of rethinking of the townhome. And we thought that uh, we could make a strategy where we would kind of like pinch, pinch the townhome. And then what that would allow is the, uh, the bedrooms in the back could gain views to the water. And we would also get a kind of garden court. So that one move accomplished a few things at a time. So uh, this is the kind of site plan. We basically created uh, six different villa types that could each of them could be mirrored. So it uh, gives you 12 different types that are then arrayed uh, across the three islands, uh, which really they, they're, they're, they're a kind of peninsula because it doesn't cross here. So there's a kind of little uh, causeway here, a little causeway there, and then these kind of uh, this, this sort of island that has water in the middle. And so this is not a rendering, this is a photo of the actual project that's built. And um, the reason why the, it doesn't show the whole island is these are the only ones that are done. But you can really be see, begin to see how, uh, how it's working. And you can also really see, um, so of course when you work in China, some, some of you know this, but you really only take projects to DD. Um, Construction documents can only be done either if you have a firm in China or by the, by the Chinese Institute. So, but we did a very advanced uh, DD. Um, and in a way, I show this in relation to the, to the other residents that I, that I showed you to the Birch residents because we also use this, some of the same ideas about the kind of um, slot of space uh, going down the middle. And here you can see on the island how uh, the, there's two levels. There's a street level, and then one story down is the edge of the lake. And so the three-story, all of these are three-story houses where you enter on the middle. And um, this is the basement level. And so in the basement is primarily entertainment areas, bars, and game rooms, and waterfalls. I mean, it's extremely decadent. Uh, this is the level, the entry kind of, the entry level, and you can see the kind of zone you know, like at the garden zone and the house zone and and how the you, you can see how the this kind of pinch affords views you know like from the rooms that are more on the street side towards the water and um, this particular house has this uh, floating object in it um, that's the master bedroom, and the underneath it is the uh, main living room. And these are the set of plans. So the interesting thing about building in China is that the, uh, so these are structures are all cast in place concrete, you know, which is something we could never do in America. So of course our houses in LA are mostly type five construction with a little bit of steel. Basically the more expensive it is, the more steel we can have, the more cost effective it is, the less steel we can have. But here this is all cast in place concrete and it's a very low PSI concrete. So the structural uh, grid is very tight. I mean, th these columns are huge and they're also really close together. But, uh, but nonetheless, we were able to achieve uh, some of the same quality that, um, that interest us. But it, it, it was fascinating to see the difference of like working out some of these problems uh, with, uh, uh, with the kind of Chinese vernacular construction versus in America. This is a version that has like two single car garages. You enter in the middle. Uh, this is a pool alongside the house. This is your main living area. This is the kitchen and the bedroom. This is one of the smaller units that we did, but this is the one that has a special floating uh, master bedroom, which has its uh, sort of bathroom over there. A kind of extra room here that gets a view. But you can see how like all the different rooms gets these kind of views to the, to the water.
And here you can see some of that kind of space in between the kind of courtyard spaces and the way you move through some of those courtyard spaces and the way that they direct your view to the outside and to the water. Thank you. Of course, question. of course, if anyone has. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, it's the answer is it's not easy. Um, uh, in the beginning, you it's a lot of convincing. You know, it's a lot of, um, and still to the, well, so for instance, in the house in Point Doom, that was one of our earlier projects, and um, that uh, uh, light box that went down the center that had that, um, like, eco resin in it, um, that, uh, it was really hard to convince him of, of that. And he, we, we, sh we showed him so many different ways, like, we, we showed him renderings, we showed him, and we went to the site and, um, you know, he, there was a steel frame up for it and then he had them take it down and then he put it back up. And then eventually, like, it was such a battle to get that in. And then later on, uh, an, uh, like a year later, a year and a half later, when, when it was being published, uh, it was being published in Interior Design and Edie Cohen, who's the editor of Interior Design, was there and she was talking to Mike and she was like, well, well what's your favorite part of the house? And then Mike literally says, the light box is my favorite part. And I look at him and I was like, what? And he's like, I know, Margaret, you were right. So uh, he eventually did the light box the way we originally designed it, but it was, uh, it was, it was not easy, actually. It wasn't an easy sell. But uh, many times what I, what I tell a client is I say, well, listen, if you, would, if you were just like out of the country and I could build your whole house and then you could come back, you would see how great this thing that I'm trying to explain to you is. Like, I know it's really hard to visualize, but, but, but you just have to trust me. So it, it, y you have to find your way to convince people until you start to have work. And then um, in our case, like, it, it still happens occasionally, but not as much because now usually people are coming to us because they see what we're doing and they, they, they want that. But, um, some clients like uh, are, are kind of lean into it more easily, and some clients don't. But but most clients, you don't choose to hire an architect if you're not already some if you if you don't have some amount of vision. Like clients are visionary actually, so because they wouldn't be you know it's not easy to build a project. So any anyone who has the idea about building something, it already has the capacity to to be visionary. So you, you just have to find a way to tap in to their vision and find a way to um, sort of uh, match like, like, like a way that you can, you can help them re-envision things. Because many times uh, we, clients come to us and they think they want one thing, but after we get to know them and after we talk about their lifestyles and their living, their method, like the ways they live, many times we can find like special features that are just for them that they never would have thought, they never would have, they, they, they can't imagine that that's what they would want, but actually through getting to know them and through getting to know um, how they live, we can actually often propose things that are like, that solve a problem they didn't know they had. Well, I would say the muleness probably comes more out of the, hmm, maybe we already always had it, like, right? Like, we're not good thoroughbreds, let's just say. But uh, certainly where we teach, you can envision um, uh, the, the critique that I'm hoping to, to create against a kind of a singular vision of about um, a new way to make architecture. And I'm just trying to say that in our work, 
it's the synthetic part of it that uh, that makes it um, uh, like transformative. So it's those moments where we've synthesized two things and create like a new thing that are often the most transformative parts of the work. And um, John and I, I, I think part of why that happens for us is because we came from a different era and we're trained with, and yet we, we, we embrace um, uh, new tools and, and new strategies for making things. Um, but I would also say it partially comes from the fact that we like to build and we have been committed, like our practice was founded on the commitment uh, to build, which sometimes means that um, you have to, if, if you want to build and you, want, you have certain kinds of projects, sometimes you have to, you, have to, you know, be on budget. <laughs> be, there's a kind of practicum uh, that we try to operate within while still trying to make something transformative. So, for instance, in our own house, you can see it's not as much about form per se, but we transform it in a different way. But mainly, you know, we couldn't afford a bunch of curves in our own house, um, which is okay. We actually don't need it because it's like uh, we get at like other qualities of space um, really through the interaction of the garden, of like the hill and the house and the garden and the house, and then even the kind of stage set quality of it. Um, but uh, what I would say is that uh, LA has been a great place to be a mule because there's so many, we, we've, the, the chances for building that we've been afforded, uh, I don't think there's a lot of other places that we could have that. So, um, and the clients, uh, the potential clients that we have, you know, there we really do get very unique clients who are interested in unique visions. I think that's super helpful. Yeah. It really can depend, but um, like the design process is usually, th you know, three to three and a half months, depending on the back and forth. Uh, the construction process or the, you know, like there can be a whole variety of, like, like we can, sometimes a home will get built in a year, you know. Other times it goes on hold for a year and then it, then it comes back for a little while and then it goes on hold for another year and, you know what I mean, then you, then you start building it, then it's like takes a couple years. So, there are some projects which can, which are, like our house we built in 11 months, you know, uh, but other houses, the Birch residence, it took three years. The client changed their mind a little bit, they, they, they kind of, you know, as they, as they saw it being built, there's like, they evolved in like uh, ideas that they had about materiality, um, you know, like, so it, it, it's not like a singular answer, but in general, um, we, we, it is a back and forth process with our client, but we usually nail down the kind of big moves within the first couple weeks. So it's not um, the, the, the longer part of the process of the designing the house is the construction documents, you know, but the design part, like for instance, the Guggenheim Museum, we did that project in three weeks, you know, so sometimes the design process is actually quite quick. Uh, it's just there's so many other parts of architecture that take so long. Or there's a house I didn't show today, but it's under construction. That house, one time, the client made an appointment to come into the office, and, and that summer we had just happened to be messing with VR. We put the whole house in VR, and uh, they came into the office, and we were like, and we had a physical model, and we had VR, and um, we didn't find out until later, but they, they, they were making the meeting with us to, to tell us the project was not going to happen. They were going to cancel the project. And then we, because the, the, the wife and the husband, they were able to walk through their house in VR, basically when they, they, basic, they didn't end up telling us they were going to cancel the project. And um, later on, uh, a few months later, when it kind of started up again, they told us a story about how they were going to cancel the project, but because the wife could walk through it, she looked to her husband and she's like, I have to have this house. So basically, VR saved a house of ours. Like... <laughs> So we use like every tool at our disposal. 
Sometimes we're just using the tools for like our own edification, but then sometimes when we do that, it actually is part of the kind of convincing, whatever that is. Either it's about convincing another new client or that client. If there's a burning last question, well, can you see why I'm so happy and proud to um, claim Margaret Griffin as a student? And I hope everybody is equally happy and inspired for the kind of things that Bob has. So thank you. Thank you.